It is December 11th, 2019, and I'm recording the first video in the series on the Second Cognitive Revolution, a tribute to Rom Hare, edited by Bo Alesso Christensen. In this first video, I will cover the preface by Jan Balsiner and the first chapter by the editor, Christensen. So let's join the editors and the authors of this volume and assume that there have been two cognitive revolutions in modern psychology. First one in the 1950s or 60s and the second one during the 1980s. Second uh, revolution is also known as the discursive turn in psychology. So these are not uh, trends that become necessarily dominant in the entire international scene of psychology. But instead, let's think about them as fundamental shifts in psychological thinking, especially with regard to cognition, human cognition, and cognitive capacities. Very quickly, we can think about the first revolution, so-called revolution, as a shift away from the environment to the organism in order to discover capacities in the organism. And the second shift, second revolution, traces back organisms' capacity to its relations with the environment, especially for human beings. This is a tracing of the relation between our capacities to the cultural, social context, social environment. The first cognitive revolution made this point, that we should pay attention to cognitive capacities, what the organism brings into the environment, the sensitivities of the, the, the sensitivities of the organism to the reality outside. This holds true even uh, if we set aside human beings and just pay attention to rats. A rat doesn't just learn about its own actions and the so-called contingencies of reinforcement. The rat also learns something about its environment. It is fair to say that the rat learns about the environment. So, for example, if the rat is familiar with an environment and then it returns to the same environment through a different entry point, through a different door, viewing the environment from a different angle this time, it can still recognize it as a familiar environment. This is the basis of concepts like cognitive maps um, proposed by Tolman before the official first revolution. So the first Cognitive Revolution argues that we ought to pay attention to faculties like thinking, remembering, attention, judgment, and how an organism, a thinking individual, is predisposed and is equipped with certain faculties that enable its psychological relation with the environment. However, this style of thinking can go too far and attribute too much to the individual and also attribute too much to what goes on inside the individual brain to the point that it requires generating something like an entire copy of the environment inside inside of the, the mind, individual mind. It can also go too far by eliminating the individual organism, eliminating, in the case of humans, eliminating the person and replacing it with the functions, subpersonal processes that are then subject to causal explorations and mechanistic accounts. So in this context, in the context of the first cognitive revolution and the ways in which it can go too far, the blind spots of the first cognitive movement, in this context, I think it is useful to understand the reaction by Rom Hare and the movement initiated by him and his colleagues. So this reaction is known as the second cognitive revolution. It's an attempt to shift the focus of psychology towards the context of cognition and recognize that our cognitive capacities are actualized. They, are, they express themselves within and only within social and cultural contexts, including norms of the context. Norms play an extremely important role here. We cannot fully understand in fact, we cannot fully understand the concept of a person without understanding the concept of a norm and vice versa. This is why it has been argued that psychology should be seen as a normative science. What does that mean? 
What does it mean to say psychology is a normative science? It means psychological capacities themselves are subject to standards of evaluation. So psychological capacities, psychological processes are themselves subject to standards of evaluation. So to understand memory, we immediately, if we understand what memory is, we understand what it is to remember something accurately or remember something well. When we understand perception, we understand an instance of a good perception that is faithful to the object, to its object. So that's the first side of normativity of psychology. And also, in addition, these psychological capacities are directed at things in the world, objects, events, relations, roles, and those things that psychology is directed at, those things are also target of evaluation. So we live in a world that has a normative dimension and our relation to the world, to that world, also has a normative dimension. Those are the two senses in which psychology is entangled with norms. Example, to occupy a position in a society, a position of a teacher, a student, a researcher, a judge, a policeman, is to enter, to occupy those positions, is to enter into social roles and relationships that come with their own norms. So to understand what it means to be a policeman is to understand that a policeman doesn't cooperate with criminals, is to understand that that policeman is not a good policeman, it's not a good instance of being a policeman. Taking up a position in, in that context, taking up a position means in part being responsive to the norms that are involved, that are associated with that position. As we start thinking about norms and people's responsiveness to norms, we might detect a kind of superficiality in this. What do I mean? I mean a mindless or unreflective response to norms can be, a, can be seen as a superficial engagement. This has been demonstrated in studies of, by studies of imitation in children, where children imitate without questioning why, and they value uh, that imitation, even the useless, imitating the useless steps in a procedure. Imitation, in this sense, allows us to unknowingly act in a way that is appropriate. It happens to be appropriate to the deep structures of the of the world of the environment while we are in fact responding to superficial features. We are following a norm, and that norm, we don't know why that norm is in place. The norm might in fact be in place because of a deeper feature of, the, of reality, a deeper feature about our relationship with the reality. But we don't need to understand that. If we just follow the norm, we happen to regard that uh, deep structure unknowingly. At the same time, these norms can be evoked to trick us into actions that we probably shouldn't engage in. Like for example, imagine you're in, at a retail store and a person who is working at the retail store is being excessively nice with you and uh, encouraging you to try many items of clothing and try many things, uh, ask a lot of questions. And as a result, it evokes that relationship with the retail store uh, staff. It evokes this response that, oh, I should buy something. And you feel the pressure that you, if you don't buy something, you should feel bad because you will not do your part in this relationship. So people who are interested in, in selling us things or persuading us, they might rely on these norms. Or they rely on our reliance. They our dependence on the superficial relation with norms. And here's another question that uh, I have there are different levels of depth at which someone can engage with uh, their role, engage with the context. Imagine a teacher. A teacher can occupy his or her position of a teacher at different levels of depth. We have, I'm sure we, we have all experienced teachers who are concerned with the superficial aspects of their role, their, their material, the teaching material, superficial aspects of education. And we have met teachers who are concerned with the deeper aspects of education. That they are, and we see this, we see this concern, the deep concern in the way they react to 
their students' questions, their students' mistakes. And now that we are focusing on psychological capacities in relation to context, in relation to the cultural, social context, my question is that what makes the difference between a relatively superficial engagement and a relatively deeper engagement with uh, one's role and with one's context. So I would like to keep this question in mind as I engage with the rest of the book. Now let's focus more directly on chapter one. This chapter begins with some biographical notes on Rom Hare. Rom Hare lived from 1927 to 2019 to October 2019, sadly, uh, passed away soon after this chapter was written, I, I believe. We also read that the second cognitive revolution can also be identified as the discursive turn, and we read about several implications of this discursive turn in the study of psychology. The first chapter introduces the rest of the book and it prepares us by saying that there are four groups of topics, four themes. Each group of topics corresponds to a part of Hare's body of work. And these are uh, the theme of personal being, social science and positioning theory, psychology as a normative science, and finally Wittgenstein and psychology. Wittgenstein and psychology, that last part I'll mention only briefly here. Wittgenstein offers certain analytic tools, including the analysis of ordinary language, and uh, also including the taking back the puzzle, the puzzle that is confusing us, and taking the elements of the puzzle back to their original source, to where they came from, where the, the concept of a rule, for example, came from that now is puzzling us. And the general aim of Wittgensteinian philosophy is therapeutic. It doesn't provide us with new insights, new knowledge, but instead it tends to deflate the questions that bother us and show that the questions might themselves be misguided. So let's turn to the first theme of a personal being. This theme has to do with the idea that persons are achieved in fact, in, this, in the other book that I will start discussing this Sunday, we read Rom Hare saying that persons are artifacts. They are achieved by taking part and developing skills of conversation. Taking part in and developing skills of conversation. Persons cannot be reduced. A person is a nexus of feelings, decisions, judgments, actions, etc. A whole network of concepts would collapse if we let go of the concept of a person. So a person is like that center point where many different concepts come and meet and in a meaningful way combine together, like the concept of intention, belief, and action. Persons, therefore, cannot be reduced to subpersonal processes because subpersonal processes no longer have personal attributes. Nor can they be reduced upward. We can reduce persons to cultural, social, constructive processes, which take away the autonomy of, of the person. A person doesn't just act. A person also narrates their conditions, their actions. They can try to justify their actions in addition to acting. They negotiate. So persons are not reducible downward or upward. The, the theme of personal being is also connected to the idea of not searching for a central processing unit in the head. No CPU or a central executive function in a more psychological la language. Cognition involves participating in various symbolic systems, systems of sign, and it requires skill and it involves being transformed through those participation. So the search for cognition shouldn't be internal to the person it should be also about understanding the symbolic systems of a participation. Moreover, personal being involves the recognition that persons have goals. Activities of persons are goal-directed. When a person is related to tools, to collaborators, to social relationships, the way they are related to those tools, collaborations, other people, the way they stay in those networks and their mode of participation makes sense when we recognize the goals that they are pursuing. 
Next, there is the theme of social science and positioning theory. Social relations, social roles, or social positions have a reality, that reality goes beyond the bodies involved in them. What does that mean? It means that the position, a social position or a social role, has the power to bring out certain actions, certain tendencies in people. In addition to actual conversations and actual interactions with other people that give us, that ascribe us with roles, we also have situations, we recognized situations that also give us roles, like being at a doctor's office or being at a funeral or being at a grocery store. These recognized situations even though they don't involve explicit relation with another person, they do compel or prohibit certain actions. And uh, the roles, uh, as scribing roles, also involve icons and symbols that we recognize. And those symbols might exert power within an identified context, like traffic light or invite, the sign that invites us to be silent in a hospital. Again, the emphasis is on persons. The nexus or a meeting point where beliefs, desires, memories, emotions, norms, roles come together. A person is the central locus of social action. Position theory, I'll read more about this and we will discuss this more, but so far I think positioning theory is a way into social science and cultural psychology. It's a recognition that mental life is mediated through symbolic or or discursive cultural practices. But we should not, here Christensen emphasizes that we should not make the same mistakes as the first cognitive revolution. We should not search for a mind behind the mind. Now that we have identified that the mind is social or discursive, we shouldn't say, okay, so where is the discursive mind behind the actual mind that we are observing? The mind instead emanates from people through their engagement with the world and with each other. The third theme, which we will discuss more, is psychology as a normative science. I already discussed this, uh, some aspects of it. This is different from, I think, different from saying that psychology is a science of the normative, which might mean that it's a natural science or interested in causal accounts of uh, normative processes. It also means that psychology itself is not neutral with respect to states of affairs with respect to psychological processes. So back to the preface. To say that psychology is concerned with norms has implications for psychology itself. We have norms and standards for evaluating psychology and those standards can change. There are roles, institutions that have the power to give permission to encourage certain forms of psychology and prohibit or discourage other forms of psychology. Those positions are themselves not scientific positions. So, for example, I was uh, having dinner with two colleagues last night and they were discussing about teaching duties and how teaching duties are dependent on our productivity as researchers. So teaching load, so teaching is basically used as a, as a form of punishment, as a form of encouraging and discouraging certain forms of engaging with psychology, certain forms of being a scholar, being a researcher, being a teacher. That, that's a normativity that is applied to psychology, to psychologists. So the position of, the position that prohibits or encourages or discourages is a political position, a position that says, do this kind of research, publish in high impact journals, that's a political position. And even if that position and the scientific position come from the same individual, they are still separable positions. The scientific position is about curiosity, wanting to answer certain scientific questions. The political position, which has scientific consequences, is not itself scientific. So Rom Hara's work and the Second Cognitive Revolution bring to our attention the fact that psychological phenomena are embedded within normative structures. Even though the normative dimension of human reality is widely accepted, it's difficult to find somebody who disagrees with it. 
Valsner points out that its acceptance hasn't seeped into the common research practice or research discourse. We hear, we still hear statements like, I study X through method Y. So I study reading through eye movement, for example. But we should hear, I study psychological phenomena X, which itself exists due to, or its existence, it depends on the normative structures A, B, C. And I study this through method Y. So Valsner's own example is about aggression, expression of aggressive behavior, aggressive emotions. Another example that is close to my mind is the example of assertive behavior by students in a class, or more generally, taking responsibility when students take responsibility for their own education. If, for example, a teacher is concerned about students taking responsibility for their own education process, this teacher should go and find out what kinds of norms, what normative situations, what normative structures that students face, what kind of situations call out, call for responsibility in students. What normative structures bring out those responses in the students? And how could we implement those structures in the educational process? So by being sensitive, by being responsive to the normative structures, we are doing more justice to the psychological phenomena. And we open a way of studying changes to psychological phenomena as people transition from one normative situation, normative structure to another normative structure and how their sensitivity to those normative structure changes. Okay, if I missed anything, if I made any mistakes, please feel free to get in touch with me or comment. In the next video, uh, next Wednesday, I will discuss chapters two and three. We will jump into the first theme in the book, personal being. Thank you for your attention and I will talk with you soon.